Wow, it's so great to see you guys virtually here in the Zoom room. I would normally be standing up and smiling at your lovely, beautiful faces. It feels kind of weird talking into uh, a screen here, but I'll do my best. So uh, one comment I wanna make, uh, Luis, is that I also am a gamer and that actually helped me with my career. So if any of gamers out there, I'm looking at you. Okay, so I have a little bit of a presentation to share with you guys. It's pretty short and depending on how long that goes, we'll have a good amount of time for Q&A. I know that there's been lots of questions coming in. Uh, I feel really excited to be here because I think that there are a lot of misconceptions about freelancing. And at the same time, there are a lot of people who want to freelance, but they don't know where to start. So my hope here today is that I can maybe help, maybe inspire, or if nothing else, at least um, let you guys know that maybe this is something that you don't want to do because that's valuable too. But uh, I'm glad that you guys all showed up. I think that that in itself is showing a lot of initiative and the fact that you showed up tells me that you could be the right people for this type of lifestyle. So, all right, let's jump right into it. I'm just going to share my screen here. Go into, okay. So the presentation today is called nine tips for freelancing. Why nine? I like the number. So uh, here is a list of some of the clients that I've worked with over the course of the last five years or so. I feel really privileged to do this. And to be honest, if I worked full time at a company, I don't know that I would have had the opportunity to do so. But one of the perks of freelancing is that you get to choose the projects that you work on and you get to have a pretty big portfolio of some really awesome folks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, if anyone's interested later, in the difference between working at a startup versus a larger organization versus an advertising agency, or even doing some personal projects and how that translates into salary versus time spent and all of those things. So um, this is kind of where I'm at today, but it didn't always start like this. It took me a while to find my path. So I actually started when I was a little bit younger back in high school, I thought I wanted to go into fashion design. And I also was a gamer, <laughs> played a lot of video games as a kid. I loved to problem solve and I wanted to find a way to combine those two passions. So I thought that if I was a fashion designer, I could do something really cool, um, put on shows and that would maybe be, be something a little bit different. I don't know. Anyway. That was a no because as supportive as my parents were, they convinced me, my dad being a senior project manager consultant and my mom being a nurse, that probably wasn't a lot of money in it for sustainability. So I switched into psychology when I was in university. And then I shortly realized I was too crazy to tell other people that they were crazy. And I didn't really love the way that it was taught. Um, it's a whole other conversation, but I feel like education these days sometimes trains people to be part of a system and not great. At least my, my experience being in school wasn't great in terms of learning how to critically think, make decisions for myself, pay my own taxes, uh, that kind of thing. The stuff that actually really can make a person excel in real life. So I switched into a program called Global Business and Digital Arts. This was at the University of Waterloo. And it was actually the first year that the program existed. So we were kind of guinea pigs and I didn't have the best experience there either, to be honest, but I did start my first business at the age of 19 while I was there. And this actually gave me a lot of insight into what it's like, what it takes, um, the excitement of working with people that really care about their idea versus just at a corporate nine to five where People are there and are watching the clock to get out. So I really learned something about myself during that time. And then I got my first job at a university at a small design studio called Pixel Tours, which was a wonderful company to work at with great people. But I really didn't love the commute. I was spending about an hour each way. And I realized that that was adding up to a lot of time per year that I could actually be spending being way more productive. And also, I wasn't really growing at the company. I felt like there wasn't really any 
vision that I had for my future and I didn't wanna get stuck. So I realized, okay, I want to eventually be a mom one day and uh, I want to be a mom before the age of 35. So I have a very small window relative to the rest of my life in order to get some of these foundational elements in place for me to um, be able to do all the things I love to do, have a family, travel, and to also have a really steady career because that was something that was really important to me. And so I heard about this crazy thing called freelancing during my first year at Pixel Tours. And I didn't really know where to start. So I kind of wish I had you know, a forum like this um, with someone who was more experienced to talk to me when I was back then because I didn't have any mentors. I couldn't find any designers that were doing this free full time. And I didn't have anyone to talk to or any sort of roadmap to follow. There weren't really many books on the kind of thing that I wanted to do. And so it was kind of a combination of trial and error and really taking a bit of a leap of faith, but it's not as risky as you might think. And I'll explain why in a second. So I found myself with a one uh, three month contract full-time contract and I left my job at Pixel Tours, which was really comfortable. And I opted to pursue freelancing. And I didn't know what I was gonna do after that three month contract to be quite honest, but I did realize that I had skills that were in demand. So all of you here today, if you're a designer, if you're interested in UX UI design, it's a really great field to be in, especially now. The skills are really coveted. And especially because of COVID, there's a lot of people who are starting up businesses at this point that are looking for help. So we'll get into that later. Anyway, so um, all of my interests from being younger kind of came into play here as a freelancer. And I started thinking about different ways to make money. So I dabbled in illustration, which I now do. Uh, and somehow people are willing to pay me for that and photography, which I used to do as a hobby. Um, I also do mentorship. I used to teach at General Assembly. And yeah, you can basically just combine some of the stuff that you do and you can actually make money from it. And it doesn't even necessarily need to be relevant to design or not directly relevant to design. So what I mean by that is psychology, for example, actually really helps me to find a job because it's what makes me unique. Anyway, enough about me now that you know my background. I wanted to talk a little bit about why I actually started freelancing. So these are the realizations that I had that for me were kind of a trigger point. So number one, I realized that society, education system, this is just my opinion, by the way, full disclosure, um, trains you to fit inside a bit of a box. And yet we celebrate and reward those who don't. So if you think of the, some of the most successful people that you know, it's quite possible or probable that they didn't have a conventional path they did go through some sort of big struggles or catalytic moments that prepared them for a life that maybe they didn't even envision for themselves when they first set out on their journeys. And so I wanted to revisit that and start questioning, why do I need to get a job? Why do I need to be a master of one thing in particular? Why do I even need this piece of paper when in university, the reality is I was mostly self-taught. So that was the first realization. And the second is uh, a song, probably know Mr. John Lennon from the Beatles. He says, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And I love this quote. So the way I like to think about my time is that every minute I spend doing something is a choice. It's a conscious choice that I'm making. And it's a choice that I'm not pursuing something else. You can only pursue the things that you, a certain amount of things with the hours that you have and that's really valuable. Time is a resource that you don't get back. And so I didn't wanna have to work and save up money just so I could travel. Um, I've actually been to over 30 country, countries so far and I'm under the age of 30. And the reason for that is because this really sat with me. It made me internalize, holy crap, if I wanna travel, I can't sit around and, and wait for these things to just happen to me. I just have to do them. and. Freelancing is one of the careers that actually enable you to do that. And then lastly, my third big realization was that there is no goal that I'm going to set for myself that isn't going to evolve. So for a while, 
I felt like I was hitting the milestones, but I was never really happy. And it's because I realized I was chasing this moving target. But then I realized that's actually a good thing. It means I'm growing. It means I'm setting new goals. And now it's about celebrating the little wins while also having the bigger picture in mind. So for those of you who are here, I'm sure you're probably already aware of some of the possible benefits of freelancing, which include things like obviously being your own boss. You no longer have a boss, you have clients and you can fire your clients in the way that you, your boss would normally be able to fire you. Not that I always recommend that, but uh, ask me questions about that later if you'd like. You get to work your own hours. So that of course depends on the nature of the clients, but I actually have clients kind of all over the world, some in New Zealand, Australia, England, Switzerland, uh, America, and then some in Canada on the East and West coasts. So because of that, they kind of understand that there's a certain overlap amount of time that I'll be working. But for the most part, I get to manage that, which means that when my friends are stuck in the office from nine to five, I see it's a beautiful sunny day outside. I wanna take my dog out for a walk. I'm going, it's great. Um, the great thing about freelancing, unlike salaried positions, and I know that this isn't the case across the board, but one of the most notable things is that you always get paid for the hours that you work. So you bill per hour. And if you work later on, later on into the late wee hours of the morning, you're gonna get paid for that. And sometimes you get time and a half. Um, Another benefit is that you make and keep way more money. So my dad says this, it's not about how much money you make, but it's about how much you keep. So one of the realizations that I had when I had my first job, which was salary, was when I went to pay my taxes, I noticed that such a large amount was actually going to tax. And that's great. I, I think it's very important to pay taxes, but at the same time, I thought about how much money I actually spent towards getting my laptop, having my home office set up, all of these things. I wasn't necessarily writing them off, and I felt like I was getting taxed twice. But when you're a freelancer, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you can actually incorporate, you can become a business and then pay yourself as an employee which means you can actually keep more money and the cost that you spend to build your business actually now uh, is basically a write-off. And so you're keeping much more money. So you could make the same dollar amount, um, but you're actually keeping much more on paper. Uh, freelancers typically charge more money because there's considered to be a higher risk. You're the, the first person hired and the first person, sorry, the last person hired and the first person fired. And so because of that, your rate hourly can be significantly higher. So we'll get to how to set your rate after this. Um, another free, fun perk of freelancing is you get to work on a variety of projects. So for me and my personality type, I can get bored easily. I know there's a lot of creatives in the room. I know you guys have moments where maybe it's early morning, maybe it's late at night, maybe it's on the weekends. Maybe there's a certain place that you go to where creativity comes to you better in some instances than in others. And sometimes you want to task switch. So there are days when you feel like you really want to focus and other days where you feel like, eh, I just want to grab my laptop, sit in front of the couch and do some stuff that doesn't require too much thought. So task switching becomes one of the perks of the job as a freelancer. And if you have a few skills, like let's say illustration and photography, if you're also doing design, branding, UX, you can kind of switch into those different things while still getting paid for every hour you spend. And it becomes really fun. Um, I work with clients um, ranging from sort of the big guys, like I worked with Harvard just a few months ago. I worked with NBC Universal, but I also work with really small startups. I have some clients right now in the crypto space. And um, the other fun part of freelancing, which I uh, have here, is when you work with startups and you are potentially able to offer more than just design, um, if you're part of the founding team, for example, you can actually try to negotiate getting some shares or options in the company, which long-term could result in quite a bit of profit. So we can talk about that later for whoever is interested. And obviously one of my favorite perks is the ability to work remotely. So that can enable you to travel. So for me, as long as I have my laptop, I don't really care where I am. 
um, I actually took a job, uh, took a, what was it? It was uh, a vacation, a three week vacation to go to New Zealand. And it was part of a Kentucky tour. So anytime we were on the bus traveling from city to city, I was just on my laptop doing work. And I basically paid for that trip and made money while on this three week vacation without missing anything. Um, and that's kind of the fun of freelancing. And I, you don't have to be chained to any one physical place. You get to live your life. And that's important. It's, it's really important. Anyway, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know you guys are here for a reason because you believe in it too. Okay, so I just want to talk about this for a second, which is that there is a huge misconception that freelancing is considered risky. So I'm going to compare this to what some of you probably these days are, are aware of, which is investing. Um, have you guys heard of the strategy to diversify your portfolio, right? Or don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's exactly what having a full-time salary job is. If you really think about it, you're spending all of your time at one company. Whereas if you were to diversify, i.e. if you were to freelance and have several clients, if one client for whatever reason doesn't work out, you still have many others. But if you lose your job and you're a salaried employee, what happens then? So in the four years that I've been freelancing, first of all, I've never had to look for a job, not once. I have never applied for a single role. It's all referrals. Um, TopTel sends me work. I'll talk about what TopTel is in a second. Um, and sometimes stuff just, just comes to me because people find me organically. And if any time a project finishes, I can actually allocate more time to some of my clients that actually want more of me, but I don't have the time to give. And so it's been incredibly stable. In fact, I've had a surplus of work and I don't think it's because I'm particularly special. Um, I think I'm good at what I do, but I know that there are people who are better than me. But because of the surplus of work that I've had, I actually am in a position now, and, and if there's anyone in the room actually that's interested in freelancing, please send me your portfolio after because uh, I'm actually growing my team. So surplus of work equals needing to get some contractors. So now I'm actually in the process of building my own design studio, not because that was necessarily my first intention, but because it was a natural byproduct of having too much work to do. So yeah, freelancing is actually not risky. It's, it's actually really safe. Um, the harder part is just getting started. That's it. But once you're started and once you have a few clients, it's actually incredibly stable. The most stable I've ever been. Okay. So let's get into those nine tips, the title of my presentation. So tip number one is that your reputation as a freelancer is actually going to be more important than your portfolio. And your portfolio is actually going to be more important than your resume. So I know in university, at least in my case, I was really taught that your resume needs to look a certain way. You need to have all of these things. It's really, really important. And that is true to some extent. But the reality is, if you're a designer, people are going to go to your portfolio. They want to know what work you've done in the past. It needs to be up to date. I've been pretty bad at that. And there's a whole bunch of projects that I've worked on for some pretty high profile clients. And I have not updated my portfolio. Um, so learn from my mistake have some key pieces so that if you are applying for something, um, make sure it's diverse. If people come to your website, they should be able to envision that you can create the thing that they need to create. So that's why my portfolio, I don't know if you guys have seen it, melissa-morgan.com. Thanks mom and dad for the basic white girl name so that everybody <laughs> can uh, you know, share my name. I actually had a girl, quick tangent. There was a girl in my elementary school class whose name was also Melissa Ann Morgan. So I just have the most common name ever. And uh, I had to hyphenate my domain name because I couldn't get it. Um, pro tip, give your kids a name where they can get their domain. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so even more important than your portfolio is your reputation. So really important to make good connections that is a big part of getting work. And if you have people who like you, if you have people that you've done right by and you've done a good uh, amount of work for, get a LinkedIn recommendation. That stuff really helps. Sometimes you have people just falling into your lap because people trust other people's opinions. So that's actually really, really important. 
really important. Tip number two, finding clients. The best way to find clients, number one, is referral. So just like I was saying on the previous slide, it's about who you know, it's about how you're known, and then the stuff will come to you. Another really good place to look when you're looking for clients would actually be incubators and accelerators. So incubators and accelerators obviously have a ton of startup companies that are early stage. They're looking for branding. They're looking for people who can join an early team. And this is also a really good opportunity to do some good work so that they recommend you to other startups in their network. It's a bit of a snowball effect. So if you can get your foot in the door and uh, actually do a little bit of work for some of these startups, not only can you snowball effect and get some work, but you might be able to negotiate some equity in some of their companies, which could be really exciting. And then number three, talent platforms. So I have a list of some uh, here. So TopTel is one that I'm part of. They've been awesome. They've actually flown me to a few places for work. So I really recommend it. it. Takes a little bit of time if you want to apply. Uh, I would say maybe two months in, in entirety from when you apply to when you do a test project and uh, the presentation and stuff like that. But if you can get on, it's well worth it. If you'd like a referral, send me a message on LinkedIn and I can help bump your application up so it's seen a little bit more quickly. Um, and you get a signing bonus if you join with me as well. Uh, vitamin T, they've also been pretty cool. Boost, Ange Boost Agents, uh, Trina is awesome over here. They're based in Toronto. Uh, Creative Circle, also based in Toronto. Creative Niche, I think has, uh, if you're in Canada, some international offices. If I know that there, was a, there were a few people internationally, so TopTel uh, is probably your best bet from my list here. These are some local to Ontario incubators over here, but there will be plenty around the world. And honestly, these days you could do remote work. Don't let it stop you if you are um, international. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm actually based in Toronto, in case anyone was wondering. Okay, tip number three, always have multiple streams of income. So just like hedging your beds, just like having a diverse portfolio, you want to have not just money coming in necessarily from UX work, but maybe find other ways to make money. So you could have passive income, like I trade a little bit, stocks and options. Uh, I also have a little photography business on the side. I do a little bit of voice acting. And on occasion, when some foolish person wants to hire me, I'll do commercial work. Um, but basically, all of these things allow me to feel like I'm really stable. Because again, if in one month, some particular branch of work that I do is a little bit slower, that's okay because the other ones will make up for it. Uh, tip number four is that imposter syndrome never really goes away. So despite that really impressive looking logo cloud that I showed you guys, I still have moments where I feel like I might not be the right person for the job. But the thing that I think makes someone like me the right person for the job is that I know that and it forces me to learn. It forces me to be curious and to do the necessary research, fill in the gaps and deliver something that I don't have a ton of confidence in. Um, I feel good about it, but I would never bet 100% that my design is working, my design is effective. But what I get to do then is I get to look at the data and I get to take a step back and I can say, I'm gonna learn from this. So imposter syndrome never really goes away. Even as a freelancer, you're gonna start sort of building up to what will eventually be a, a full-time freelancer career if that's something you want. Um, and at least for me, it still doesn't go away. I'm considered a professional, I'm considered really successful, still sometimes feel like an imposter. So that's just part of being human. Okay, tip number five, if you want to freelance full-time, then you've got to get good at a lot of things. So not just your hard skills, but your soft skills are really, really important as a freelancer. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of tough love. If you are not someone that likes to present, if you're not someone who feels comfortable kind of defending your ideas and pitching yourself and selling yourself in a way, which is actually tip number six here, um, then freelancing full-time will be tough. Uh, 
because it, it is a bit of an entrepreneurial pursuit. You are creating a business in a way and, and you are the product. You are selling your services. You need to be able to talk about yourself. You also need to have some really good personable skills. Um, <laughs> Over the four years that I've worked with, I don't even know how many, 50, maybe 60 plus clients, I cannot tell you the eclectic mix of egos that I've had to manage. <laughs> um, and I say that with love, I love my clients. Um, but sometimes the reality is, is that a big part of this job is managing egos. It's managing um, different emotions design, even though it's meant to serve a functional purpose and can be evaluated and measured in terms of success, sometimes people get emotionally attached to it and they treat it like art. They treat it as a subjective thing rather than what it should be treated as, which design is meant to solve a problem and it's meant to ultimately help the business make money. So that does happen and you guys gotta be prepared for that. So uh, if you have a background in psychology, or even if you just like to read books about psychology, that's something that you'll find really, really useful. Okay, so back to tip number six. I put some stars around this one because of how important I believe this really is. And without it, uh, you will probably struggle <laughs> if you wanna try to pursue freelancing full-time. You have to know what makes you unique. Here's why. If you're a freelancer, People probably are prepared to pay more money and they also are hiring you because their existing company and their full-time staff either A, doesn't have the time or the bandwidth to do something and so they want someone who works really quickly and efficiently, and B, because they don't have the skill set within their organization as it currently stands. That's why they're hiring a freelancer is because you are providing something that they currently don't have. So if you're just another designer, that's not enough. They want something that they don't already have. So you have to think about what makes you unique and you have to think about what is a compelling story that you could tell about yourself. Your personal brand is really important. I know that maybe sounds like a cliche and there's a million books written about it. I'm not gonna preach about it. But you do need to be able to say, here's why I am the right person for the job. For me, I have a background in psychology. I can explain how people think. I actually have a lot of background playing video games. I can't tell you how many jobs I've gotten because I've actually worked on some games. Um, and it's because of my experience as a problem solver and so many platforms these days looking to gamify their in-app uh, experiences that they hire someone like me who's done that. Uh, voice acting and my voice, which I just did for fun when I was a kid. I used to watch this uh, YouTube channel called Planet Dolan. And uh, I applied never thinking I was gonna get it. And then I got this job as this purple bird uh, on this YouTube channel. And when people found out that I could voice act, they said, oh, we need demo videos. We need this, we need that. We can give you that. Plus we can give you illustration, which I used to do on the side. You can understand our clients and you have a background in gaming. So all of these things kind of help to create uh, me, which is my unique value proposition. And so I would really encourage you guys to think about and spend some time thinking about what makes you unique. Um, and unique doesn't necessarily mean what makes you better. That's another misconception is that sometimes you think you have to say why you're the best person versus someone else for the job. I've never tried to compare myself to other designers because I don't know what other designers have to offer. All I can say is, if I understand a problem, I can tell you whether or not I think I'm the best person to fix it. And it's funny, I've actually gotten clients before um, where I've talked them out of hiring me for certain things. And that actually results in them giving me referrals or hiring me for a different problem in the future. So I'll give you one example, which was, um, I had this entrepreneur who came to me, uh, Series A funding and very, very excited, uh, wanted to put together sort of a prototype, wanted to go to investors and, and raise some more. Um, but they were at such an early stage that I actually told them that it wasn't necessary. And so we could have just, instead of building an entire prototype, let's just make some key screens um, and pitch it to make sure that we're kind of getting feedback from users before we actually go and build the whole thing. And he actually loved that. He said, okay. Um, cool, let's do that. So he hired me for 
later on down the road for a smaller version to kind of help him with his pitch. So um, never feel like just because you have an opportunity, you have to make yourself the right person for the job. Also, don't be afraid to say no. If there's something you don't want to do, if there's something you feel uncomfortable doing, uh, even if you're a little bit hesitant about something that you've done. I've had interviews where I've said, hey, I I'm going to be honest, I haven't done this particular thing before, but I have done this thing, which makes me feel more confident because I believe it's similar and I'm pretty sure I can figure it out. And you'd be surprised that a lot of companies don't actually require you to have every single uh, bullet point that they have on their job description, for example. If you can prove that you're someone who can figure it out, if you're likable, if you are unique, you're going to get the gig. Okay, so tip number seven, once you've set your rates with a client, it's very difficult to change it. So um, when I first started freelancing, a friend of mine who used to freelance part-time actually told me this. And I didn't realize how accurate it was until it happened to me. So when you first tell someone that your rate is, let's just say for simplicity, 50 bucks an hour, it's gonna be really tough if you come back in a year and you suddenly say you want 60. It's possible, but difficult. So clients will start to know you as that kind of external vendor that they can rely on for that rate. And they'll factor that into their budgets if they're thinking about hiring you. So um, let's actually just take a quick tangent before we go to the next tip and talk about how you actually set your rate. So this is a question that I get a lot. I'm sure a lot of you actually have it. Uh, we'll probably circle back to it later in the Q&A period. But the first thing that you wanna do is you want to figure out what is the market actually paying for what you can offer. So don't do something vague, like just Google, what do UX designers get? What do product designers get, et cetera. You wanna actually figure out someone, who someone with your similar skill sets, what kind of job do they have? You can go on Glassdoor, you might have to do a little bit of investigation, but you wanna figure out how does someone comparable to you and your skill set get compensated? And then what I actually do when it comes to freelancing is you wanna, tack on an additional 20 to 25%. So that's kind of the premium that companies are willing to pay because they recognize that freelancers are kind of av available on a whim. And uh, because you're not getting the, the employee benefits, let's say you're not on payroll, um, then you know, they, can, they can pay you more. When I actually, I actually hired a full-time employee and I didn't know this, I'm curious if anyone else did. Um, but when you hire an employee, you actually have to pay the government about ten to twenty thousand dollars just to put them on your payroll. So I actually prefer to hire contractors, and you'll find companies prefer, in many cases, to hire contractors and write it off as an expense rather than to pay them on payroll. Which is also why they're they'll be willing to pay you more because they don't have to spend that additional amount. So I didn't even know that. That was something interesting. Okay, um, the next thing you want to do is you want to figure out. What is the value that you can bring to the business itself? So for example, if I'm working on the product features for an app, if I'm the one figuring out what are the users gonna like, I'm making this thing from scratch, and then this company is going to profit off of the ideas that I bring them. They're gonna make money because I'm basically building this app as a product designer. Bit of a different value than let's say if I'm just doing illustrations, which is still fun and still valuable, but that maybe enhances the experience rather than makes the fundamental app itself. So if I'm making the fundamental app itself, I'm definitely gonna be asking for more money because I recognize that that is a major pillar uh, and of tremendous value. In fact, without me, they might not even have an app. So because of that, I will charge on the higher end of what my average rates would be. And so I never say I have X amount per hour. I know that I have kind of the minimum amount that I'm willing to work for and there's no maximum. Um, but that's how you want to think about it. You want to think about what is the role that you're bringing? How much strategy does it involve? Is it the kind of work where you're going to have to sit down and be really, really focused to do it? Or is it the kind of work that you could have some music on in the background, feet up, coffee beside you? maybe even a TV show on in the background and do it like that. Not that I recommend doing your work that way, um, but that kind of thing. 
Next thing is you want to think about the higher the risk, the higher the reward. So risk, uh, what I mean in, in by this is if you're taking on a really short contract, that's considered higher risk. If it's a higher turnaround time, if the deadline is quicker, you can charge a premium on top of your freelancer premium for that. And companies are typically pretty understanding of that, right? If you want something really, really quick, if it's only one week, if you have to push things aside, potentially say no to other contracts to take this one, then you need to be compensated fairly for that. Oops, what happened? Woo! I went backwards. Okay. Uh, and then trust your merit, trust in yourself. Sometimes it's tough to know how much you're worth, but you'll build your confidence along the way. And you need to believe that you're the person who's going to figure it out. If you have poor self-confidence um, and, you know, that was something, that's something I think everybody struggles with at some point. And I even told you imposter syndrome is something that doesn't go away. But if you don't believe that you can figure it out, if you don't believe that you can solve most problems that are thrown your way, then this is going to be very difficult for you as a career path. <laughs> you have to be one of those people. Uh, I think, I think to be successful as a full-time freelancer, you have to believe in yourself. And even if you don't understand something, you have to have the drive, the desire to figure it out and eventually get there and solve those problems. Okay. And then lastly, a little bit of a pro tip that I have, if you can get some clients based out of the US, uh, and I say that as a Canadian, um, then your US clients will actually pay you in US dollars, which is pretty great. So uh, yeah, that one kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> okay, tip number eight, when you work with startups, consider ways to negotiate options or equity. So I talked a little bit about this before. So I'm going to assume here that everybody knows what getting equity or shares in a company refers to or, or the options to buy it. And the reason that this is so cool is now you actually get to be an entrepreneur. So I've had some people ask me, hey, Melissa, you were an entrepreneur before you had your own business. Sure, you have other clients, but don't you miss being an entrepreneur? And my answer to that is I'm still an entrepreneur. I have my awesome contractors and my employees that work with me. And I also have a piece of the pie of the work that I'm actually creating, of the work that I'm building. And I'm realizing that if these companies do well, then I get to benefit. So not only am I now highly motivated to give it my all, give it my best work, because I know I'm going to see direct profits from this company. I'm also thinking differently about the work that I do. And it's making me um, feel like I'm getting rewarded, not just for every hour I work, but for every future hour that this thing that I made is working on my behalf. And so that's kind of really cool. And, and I know that there are some profit sharing structures when you're a full-time salaried employee, but not in the way that when you're a freelancer, like, like right now I have stake in four companies that I currently work with. And that's so exciting. Anyway, um, register and be paid as a business. Pay yourself as an employee and write stuff off. So this is possibly uh, the most important thing that I can share with you guys that I was very lucky to learn from pretty early on. Um, so I'll just give you kind of at a high level how you want to do this and what the benefits are. So when you register as a business, you can do that as a sole proprietor. I did it as a, a corporation. So Morgan Consultants Inc. is kind of my working incorporation, uh, incorporation name. And then anytime I send an invoice for my work, I get my clients to pay Morgan Consultants Inc. And then Morgan Consultants Inc. will pay me as an employee. And so I only pay myself as much as I need for the most part for living expenses and things like that. And then the company can then, uh, I can write a lot of things off so if I'm buying a laptop, if I have a desk, if I have, uh, because I do acting, I can actually write off all of my makeup, my clothing that I use for auditions. I can write off my Uber expenses when I go to the office. Um, and this is kind of the fun part is if you can diversify the, the work that you offer, then more things become part of your write-offs. And so um, I call it double taxation. I don't know if that's actually a term, maybe it is, um, but you get to avoid double taxation. So when you get paid 
from a salaried position, you pay your tax at the end of the year, but you're also paying taxes on the laptop that you bought, the makeup that you bought, whatever it is, the suit that you purchased. When you're a company that's paying for that as an expense, then that's just an expense. You don't get taxed twice for it. You're not getting taxed on the money that you're making. And then again, on the expenses that you had. So that's such an important piece that I, I couldn't, you know, <laughs> state enough. And for what it's worth, don't be intimidated by becoming a corporation. It's something that you can do for, I think I did mine for 500 bucks online, maybe a little bit more nowadays. Uh, you can just register online. Uh, you'll get yourself an HST number in, in Ontario. This is different everywhere else, but in Ontario, it's uh, $30,000. Once you hit that in revenue, then you get your HST number and then you can charge tax on top of that. So you get to keep way more money. Now, one caveat I will say that I also wish I knew is that when you go to purchase a home, banks do not like freelancers. So this is one kind of big downfall that I didn't know. So when I went to buy my first house, I went to the bank and they basically laughed at me because obviously on my personal income statements, I was not making that much money. When I showed them my business income statements, they said, that's great, but we need at least three to four years of history to even know if we can give you this money. So I have to go through a third party lender. And so my uh, interest rates are actually a lot higher. So that's something I wish I knew, um, something to be cautious of if you're planning to buy a home in the next few years um, you can pay yourself more but then obviously you pay more on taxes so a uh, bit of a blessing bit of a curse if you want to buy a house otherwise this is the way to go okay and uh, that was actually my last tip so now I just want to get into some hopefully really useful tools that I use pretty much on a daily basis so uh, probably better tools out there. These are just the ones that I use that I find work really well. So for bookkeeping, I just use Excel. Really, really important to have good records. The last thing you wanna do is be hunting people down because they didn't pay an invoice. So you wanna be really organized. Uh, design tools, Figma, uh, Adobe Cloud subscriptions, also great. You can use Jira. Sometimes my clients like to use it. And then Slack for communication, organization and planning, Coda is a really good tool, similar to Notion, similar to Confluence. Maybe you guys have heard of it. Uh, it's free. I really like it. It's got some good integrations as well. For icons, uh, I recommend Feather icons and App Streamline. Uh, App Streamline, you can pay for. Feather is completely free, but uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty awesome. Some stock photos and illustrations. Maybe you guys have heard of these too. Unsplash, Pexels, FreePick, and Undraw. Plugin Stark is good for checking contrast and then go full page. I use this almost every day it's to take screenshots in a, of an entire web page. And then for scheduling, because my clients are, like I said, sometimes on completely different time zones. So Calendly and Google Calendar and sharing those with, uh, with each other helps to keep me organized and allowing for less friction when people try to book me for stuff. Okay, and that concludes uh, my speaking portion of the presentation. And I guess uh, I'm happy to stick around for about a half hour or so to answer any questions that you guys might have. So would love to open the floor. And I guess, uh, Caro, if I can get your assistance on that, that would be amazing. Thank you guys. Hello, hello. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and we had a couple in the ch uh, Slack channel too or in the chat channel. Um, so I've kind of uh, bunched them up into a few things. So like mental health, um, designing for clients um, and like yourself as a company um, and just some general advice. So um, I'm gonna start off with the first question is how do you avoid overloading yourself? <laughs> I don't know if I do. <laughs> um, no, it's a, that's a great question. One second, let me just, can I uh, do, 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 view, enter full screen. There we go, I'll just keep that kind of open in the background. How do I avoid overloading myself? Um, to be honest, for the first year, I was crazy overloaded because I didn't really know how to manage my time. I was trying to figure out how long things even took me because I was taking on so many jobs that I had never done before. And so um, a lot of it came from learning about my own skills as an individual, 
being able to let go of projects when I realized that maybe I could spin my wheels for a bit and have them be 5% better, but ultimately that's not going to matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, nowadays, it's a matter of prioritization. So I have to ask myself, how much am I willing to put into this project versus how much am I getting out? And then I'll kind of give it a mental, uh, a mental number in terms of value as to how much I actually want to do that thing. Is it even worth it? And if it is worth it, then I'm more likely to spend time on it. There are obviously times in life where there's stuff happening around you and you're busy and uh, well, you have to prioritize work a little bit differently. And so sometimes I take on fewer clients. If I know I actually want some time off, I'll give my clients a heads up. Uh, I'll slow things down. There have been, uh, actually recently, I had to let one of my clients go because I realized that the communication style of the client and the infrequency of requests was not something that was working with the kind of vision that I ended up having for myself. Um, so that's, that's a roundabout way. So let me just boil that down to succinct uh, responses, which is number one, have a vision for yourself. Like really think about how do you want to spend your time and which projects are going to be in service of the kind of freelancer, the kind of career that you want to craft for yourself. And then number two, factor in, if you really like that stuff, then maybe it doesn't actually feel like you're really doing too much work. So for me, because I have some of these projects where I'm doing illustration, for example, to me, that's like a break. It's like taking a break from all of the high level strategy stuff that I have to do all day. And I actually love that work. So I'm okay to theoretically work 70 hours in a week because the stuff that I would do for fun anyway, I'm getting paid for. And I think that that's um, maybe another cliche, but if you can love what you do, then you never really work a day in your life, right? So it's up to you. It's how you manage your time. You have to ask yourself, um, what are you willing to do? What do you like to do? What are the things that feel like work? Um, do you have family? Do you have other commitments? How does that play in? Um, and then you just figure it out the more you do it. A lot of it is trial and error. Oh, sorry. If you see me looking at the screen, it's because I'm trying to figure out the next question. Um, and I think actually a great question to follow up on that one is, um, so you talked a little bit about um, like kind of promoting and branding yourself, but how do you, um, I guess these are, there are two things that go with this. How do you brand yourself? And how does that work then with the uh, with choosing your the business and the projects, right? Because the projects and the business probably um, kind of do reflect the brand that you want to create, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So for me, it goes back to values again. So uh, I think I yeah I mentioned it earlier in my presentation that originally I went into psychology. I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And fundamentally, what was underneath that for me was that I wanted to help people. And I loved to solve problems. So I realized that all of these different career paths that I thought I was going to take or this mess that I thought I was becoming, it was actually just me trying to find different ways where I could solve problems and where I could help people. And so I have had opportunities of actually funny story. I was uh, at one point proposition for the highest salary that I had ever been offered by a company that was not in line with my morals. Um, and I had to say no to it because it's not something that I would feel proud of. It's not something that I would want. And so even now when I take on projects, I have to ask myself sort of three things. Number one, do I want to do it? Is this going to be fun for me? Is this something that is in line with my morals? Uh, number two, is this something that I can actually do well? Am I the right person for this job? Um, this is something that I struggled with. I was really struggling with how to say no to people. When I first started freelancing, I just wanted to say yes to every single client that I got, any opportunity I had. Um, and with time, I realized that that was actually not helpful. Um, it's actually better, even if you're going slower at first, to 
keep in mind what your bigger vision is and only work on the projects and work on the clients where you know you can perform well because those referrals are so important and your reputation is so important. You don't want to burn any bridges. You always want your clients to feel like, yeah, I would recommend Melissa. Oh, you need a designer? I know the perfect person for you. And again, everything is a trade-off. You spend time doing one thing, working on one project, that's time that you could have spent working on another project. You no longer have it. So that's really important. And then number three is, well, how do you feel about the company? Um, how do you feel about the people that you're working with? What's your day-to-day -day gonna look like? Who's the team? Um, sometimes the people that you work with can make or break a project. Like really, you wanna find out what your day-to-day -day is gonna be. And if that's something that you can thrive in and you can enjoy and they can enjoy you because sometimes it's just not a fit and then that never goes well. Um, freelancing, quick tangent, just because I, I realized I didn't really touch on this. Um, freelancing can be a little bit lonely sometimes. Um, and other times it can be completely overwhelming because you feel like you talk to so many people on a regular basis. So it's about finding that balance. I think I've now found a balance where I never feel alone. Um, and you can kind of work at different spots in cafes. You have these regular meetings with people um, and it kind of creates this really awesome experience at the end of the day. But anyway, small tangent, back to questions. <laughs> no, that, that actually, um... Kind of a good segue into the next question is you had talked about you want to make sure you keep your reputation intact. You want to make sure that you deliver good products and like good deliverables, right? And high quality deliverables. But how how do you know that, right? Like how much experience do you need to have if you can quantify this, right? How much experience do you need to have in a certain subject area or, or practice area to be able to say, Yes, client, I can do that for you. Sorry, I know that's like, a, I know that's a hard question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. Uh, I don't know that there is a black and white answer for that. I do think that mm -hmm. this, is, this is the kind of situation where the first, the first thing you need to figure out is what is the problem that the client has? And then forget about figuring out if you can solve it with what you know in the moment, figure out if you're the person who can figure out how to solve it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the best advice that I can give as to whether or not you think you're right for it. Like, I, for example, I never called myself a product designer until the last couple of years. Uh, my client actually realized that he was asking me for a lot of uh, questions, what should we build? Why should we build it? And I didn't even know where was that line between UX and UI. I never thought I was qualified for certain product design jobs. And then I realized mm -hmm. I was actually doing product design because I was figuring out exactly what to make. I was managing a team. I was doing this stuff already. And so sometimes you actually have more experience than you realize. Um, and a lot of those things are transferable. Like I played video games as a kid and apparently that was experience and it was relevant for a company that wanted to gamify their app. Um, and so you can draw upon these experiences from your past and you can think about, will those things help me to solve this problem? Um, am I the right person for the job? That's kind of how you want to think about it. There's no magic number amount of years. To be honest, I think that's a bunch of BS that you need a minimum amount of years experience to do something. I've never agreed with that. I think that's super dated and I, I don't understand why companies still have minimum X amount of years. What they're really saying is they just want someone who they think is really experienced. Like I've taken jobs where they've asked for people with 15 plus years experience when I had three and I was hired by those companies and I have recommendations on my LinkedIn profile from these places. It means nothing. It's so arbitrary. The people who write these things are not designers. They just want someone who can do the job. So they're looking for you. They're hoping you can solve the problem. And if you can believe in yourself enough and convince them that you can, then you have enough experience. Well, so this is, I have uh, wanted to remind you, you had mentioned that you wanted to talk about the difference between working as a freelancer and working as a startup. Hmm. Sure. The, uh, the the difference of of being a freelancer versus having a startup. Is that the uh, no of 
you had mentioned um, it or like early in your talk, you had mentioned um, that you wanted to touch on the differences between working at a startup um, and freelancing oh. because of that, like, I think it was that creative unboundness, so to say, um, and that like responsibility like that you have to do the things, right? Like that level of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you for whoever asked that question and reminding me to circle back to that. So as a freelancer, you have a bunch of options of the kind of clients that you can work with. So there are startups that you could work with. You can work with, and, and startups, by the way, could be one guy. I worked with someone who was a parent who wanted to make an app for his kids. It was super sweet and his grandkids. Uh, all the way up to a really well-funded company, like there was a, I can't disclose exactly what I was doing for it, but it's a Forbes company. They were a startup um, and they had me do work there. So there's kind of all of these, it's a big spectrum. Uh, you also have advertising agencies that might hire you for sort of one-off jobs, usually just to fill in um, for smaller projects. You also have uh, studio experiences where sometimes they want you in-house for a while and they're sort of shorter contracts. And then you have your big companies that usually with the bigger companies, I find you have sort of less uh, big decisions that you are allowed to make as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been my experience. I'm not saying that's always the case, but typically the bigger companies, they have a vision and they want a freelancer who can execute. They do hire you for your skill set. They do hire you because they believe that you're the right person for the job. And maybe you can bring some to, something to the table that their internal team can't or and or doesn't have the time to. Uh, but if you're looking to do work where you get to be more of a decision maker, then you're probably going to prefer, on average, working at startups. Uh, and the reason for that is because you're usually working really closely with the founders. Uh, it's usually a small team. There's people that are hiring you because not just because you're a designer, but you actually have an opinion. Um, and this is something that I look for too when I hire people. Like when you're a small team, everybody is a pillar. Everybody is really important. Everyone's voice needs to be heard. So it's it's really important that you're able to have convictions about why you feel a certain way about a design choice. And if you can do that, then your voice is gonna be really respected and you're gonna start being a part of all of the big company decision-makings. What gets built? When does it get built? What is, when does it get shipped out? Um, what does it look like? And then how do you market it? All of these conversations you can be a part of. So the other kind of fun part about working with startups is you have to wear multiple hats. So you're never really just going to be a designer. You're also going to be doing Q&A, quality assurance. You're going to be giving presentations. You might even be attending conferences on behalf of the company. Um, you might get to do a whole bunch of stuff. If you're working with the bigger companies, uh, it's a really great way to get some cool names on your resume, like some of the ones that I have. But as you guys probably suspected, right, Harvard is it's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm so grateful for it. But um, you know, I didn't get to make any of the decisions, really. I had a, a small part of a, of a project and that's all they wanted me for. So it really depends. Like you got to find your own style. It's kind of like if you're a dancer, you want to find your own rhythm. You want to figure out what works for you and where you fit best in that. Um, if you were to work for, uh, if you're a self-employed, freelancer, you can do all of them, which is kind of what I do, but in different amounts and every client is different. So you have to, you have to kind of find your groove with all of them. Okay. So we have, so we have just a few more minutes. So I want to touch on two things, two themes that I'm seeing come up. Um, and I kind of go hand in hand, I guess. So uh, first question, how do you get your first client? My first client, I got, uh, where did I get my first client? It was a contract through TopTel. So TopTel, I spent about two and a half months just applying to get on their platform. Actually, the first time I applied to TopTel, I was rejected. I was told that I didn't have uh, enough skill sets that they were looking for. So um, I was more of a visual designer and they told me they wanted more of a UX designer. So I actually had to go back and work at it before I got accepted the second time around. 
Um, and then that was the first three month contract that they actually sent me. And from there, uh, because this particular contact, it was just pure coincidence, also happened to be based in a city that I live in. They had me come in a few times to their office space and it happened to be an incubator. So while I was there, I was networking and I met some other founders of startups and uh, my three month contract turned into six because I was doing a good job. And then as I kind of met more people, I started getting other sort of secondary contracts. Um, and for the record, hey, like I'm in desperate need of some UX UI designer. So if anyone's looking for a job or some freelancing gigs, please just message me. I will give you your first freelancing job if you're good. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, but yeah, that it really helps to, to know people and um, networking re referrals, honestly, like jobs after job comes after referral. Even now that I'm part of the top tell network, I get referrals from the recruiters because they know that I did a good job on some of the other projects. And so they'll say, hey, Melissa, do you wanna do this thing? Um, there, for example, I'm, I have never claimed to be a professional photographer. I don't even feature photography on my website publicly, but I had uh, someone from my network who was part of the top tell network recommend me for a job that required photography because of my Instagram feed. I couldn't believe this. And my Instagram is not even that good. Like there are professional photographers, but a company actually flew me out to Mexico to take some corporate headshots. Um, and it's because of the people that I know, they're like, Melissa's reliable. We'll send her all the way from Canada to Mexico. We'll pay for all of this stuff and she can go take the photos. And I was like, are you guys sure? I don't even have the equipment. Oh, we'll buy it for you. So they let, they bought the light, they sent it to me and all of this stuff. And then they flew me down there, paid for everything and then came back. And for a job that I didn't think I was qualified for, but it's true. When I was there, I just figured it out because I knew I couldn't afford to mess it up. Because if I messed it up, I would be wasting time. I'd be wasting company money. I would look like an idiot. I'd lose my reputation. And so the way that I actually thrive positively for the better or worse is on a lot of stress. So <laughs> stress me out enough and you know, I'll, I'll figure it out somehow. Um, but yeah, sometimes you, it takes a little bit of luck. It takes a little bit of people believing in you. It's about who you know. Uh, it's about networking, getting your foot in the door to incubators, um, maybe even a little bit of cold calling if it comes down to it. I've never done that, but um, my boyfriend's in sales and it works for him. So <laughs> I'm just thinking about my Instagram. They would just see cats. Constantly. <laughs> a cat, not multiple, not even multiple, just one. Um, so if you know someone who needs a cat, let me know. Um, they can only borrow it, not keep it. Um, so uh, we have just about four minutes left. I'm going to drop the question that everyone wants to know, and we're going to talk about money. Um, how do you price yourself? Because you talked about like you don't want to charge 50 and then 60 the next year, right? So how do you, so how do you find that sweet spot? How do you, um, how do you know that that is a competitive price, right? And so like in line with the market and then how do you do that with like international stuff, right? You start to get in, you know, the U.S. dollar, but how do you do, like, how do you do those taxes? Like, like what are some, what are some tricks to the trade on that? Okay. Yeah. So pricing and, and how much can you, can you make? So let's see where to start. It's such a big topic. Yeah. I guess the best place would be like, how do you, like, how do you do a competitive, like we would say like a competitive analysis, right? How do you do competitive analysis on this? Like on your, on your competitors, your other freelancers, how do you do this? I know how yeah. salons do it, but I don't know how freelancers do it. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's about figuring, like if you go to some job boards, you'll actually see how many, how much money or the range is, the salary range. Uh, you can actually break it down. I always compare myself to the dollar equivalent of people getting paid in Silicon Valley per hour. Um, that's kind of what the standard is for freelancing in both Canada and America, roughly speaking. Um, so if you just, find the salary of a role that's kind of close to yours. And then you say this much equals how much per hour, you will have a ballpark. Mm -hmm. Now that number might look high. It probably will. Um, 
that could be something that you build up to. You never want to overcharge people. You really want to feel good about the money that you're making. Like I, I can't stress this enough. I'm not a money grabber. I will never charge money if I feel like I'm not actually delivering the value that corresponds with it. So it's really, really important that, uh, that you do that. Uh, there's another resource that you can check. So vitamin T, for example, comes out with an annual report where they actually say what the average salary of each occupation is per year and how and the rate change over time. It's probably a bunch of online resources, too, that give you um, sort of a, a comparative dollar figure. Um, but I don't know that it's, that's necessarily the best way to think about it. So I'll, I'll just let you guys know. So my first job. I won't tell you what I'm making now exactly, but I'll give you a range. So my first job, which uh, I was an intern at a small company, I was making $20 an hour. $20 an hour, I thought, oh my God, that's so much money, I'm a student, I've never made this money before. Then I got a job at Pixel Tours and I was on an 80K salary, which is about the equivalent of $40 an hour. So now I'm like, oh my God, I've doubled my income, this is insane. And then when I became, a, when then uh, we actually had open book policy at, at this company and um, I got to see what I was being billed out for. So I knew I was making $40 an hour, but they, the company, because it was open book, I could see what they were charging. They were charging people $80 an hour for the services and then paying me 40. And yeah, that's how businesses make money. And anytime I, I learn accidentally from my clients, you're not supposed to discuss it, but my clients tell me what TopTal is billing me out for. I'm like, oh my God, that's so much money. I'm not even making that. How are they keeping this much for not even doing any work? But all businesses have to make money, right? Anyway, um, so that I was getting billed out for $80 an hour. I was like, you know what? I'm going to freelance. And then when I started freelancing, I started, so this was four years ago. I started at 75 an hour and that I knew was fair because I had the experience of seeing what people were actually already paying for my services just indirectly through a company. And so um, that was four years ago. I'm not going to tell you guys how much I make now, um, but it's been going really well. So uh, yeah. And when clients pay in, in US dollars, it, it also makes things a little bit sweeter. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, no, I, know really, I think I checked a lot of those boxes. So, okay, good. Yeah. Um, I think, so I tried to address most all the questions in a theme way so that I might like, so for the attendees, like I might not have addressed, answered your, asked your question directly, but hopefully I addressed some of it or we addressed some of them. Um, but I do wanna be respectful of time. So we, we are yeah. right on the dot. I'm okay um, to stay for another 10 minutes. If, if we have more questions, I, I want to, you know, give as much value as I can. If there's anything, any burning questions that people have. Uh, let me look real quick. I guess, was there anything they had? I see some stuff about international stuff. So that's probably the other, the only other theme that I, that I have. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Well, was... Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the so some people were wondering, um, like, how does freelancing overseas work? So, like, do you, if you ever have clients in China, Japan, Europe, you know, how how does that work when you have like the language or the cultural like differences? Um, is that something that even comes up? Uh, to be honest, for me, it, it hasn't. I am lucky to be a native English speaker. Uh, I speak a little bit of French and I understand a little bit of Spanish and a tiny bit of Japanese, but other than French, I haven't really had to tap into those skills. Uh, not, not really. Um, yeah, I, I think if, if they're looking to hire you, they, there will probably be someone that can speak your language. Although I have worked with people, uh, have, there was a team in Palestine that I was working with, a dev team. Um, and you can use transcription-based tools that can translate for you if that comes down to it. I do think that once you kind of get the process going, things become uh, a lot easier to communicate. So if you're organizing your design files, for example, then you have less difficulty communicating what should be where and, and things like that. So it really just depends. Um, yeah, let's see. Wow, there's so many questions in here. 
<laughs> there's a bunch. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to take a scroll through. I like I said, I yeah. try to get most of them in themes, but take a scroll through, see if there's any that like that I missed that uh, stand yeah. out to you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to go really rapid fire because I know I can talk a lot. Let's see. Um, how do I balance and schedule out my time, time blocking and programs? And then someone else I know asked for how do you log your time? Um, Toggle is a really good free tool, T-O-G-G-L. I know I didn't write that, I probably should have. Uh, and I use it as a time tracker for myself and my, uh, my contractors. So at the end of the month, I can go in and I can see how long everybody spent on which project. And I can just quickly pull reports and then invoice like that. So uh, Toggle, really good tool um let's see uh this is a good question should you be concerned about creating or promoting your personal brand if you're doing it as a business versus yourself so um to be honest i have i have been trying to carve out time to create a brand under like Morgan Consultants Inc. is not a very sexy design studio title. I'm fully aware of that. So I need a name and it's every designer's worst nightmare to do their own branding. So that's something that I'll have to think through a little bit more. Um, but my personal brand has been doing well enough that uh, I haven't had to pay attention to it. So it's it's up to you. It's a personal it's a personal choice. I do think that there's a lot of merit actually when you're a freelancer in being the face of your own brand, um, unless you have a team for which to build these kind of things around. And now that I'm growing a team, I don't want it to just be me. I want my my colleagues and my uh, contractors to be in the spotlight just as much, if not more, than I am. They should be recognized for their work. So I guess it depends on the stage that you're in. Okay, um, is this one, how do you set up contracts with US-based clients? Uh, most of my US-based clients are done through TopTel, uh, or they'll send me a contract that their lawyers will kind of put together. Um, you don't need a work permit to work with international clients if you're in Canada, uh, as long as you know, you're paying your taxes like everybody else. So there's no issue there. Uh, do I have any design tips on doing a, a test, a test design for a client? I think you mean design test, Roxy. Um, so if I'm understanding that, I would say uh, I've done some design tests before and you want to make sure that you're demonstrating that you could do it. Don't try to use a little amount of time that they tend to give you for a design test to try to do everything. You want to look, you're trying, but you also want to look like you left it off in a place that you could, um, you could have actually finished down the road um, if you had the right time and the right resources. So they just need to imagine that you're the right person for it. It's almost like an audition. Think of it, think of it like that. Uh, let's see. Do you yourself hire junior designers to work with slash mentor? Yes, I do. I'm also part of Design Lab. So I get assigned mentees. Uh, I don't know if Dylan's in here, but shout out Dylan if you are. I let him know about this session this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I didn't necessarily know that I would love to mentor, but I started loving to teach. I didn't know I would love to teach either. So I'm just trying to help people who want to do this or are interested in learning about it. So yeah, if, if you guys want to learn more, let's have the conversation. Um, I'm happy to set some time up with anyone that would like to connect, message me on any of my platforms and, and let's just chat. Um, what else? How much time do I have? Four minutes. All right. How quickly can I go here? Um, you talk fast, we'll listen quickly. <laughs> I hope this is useful for you guys. Okay. Do you use Wise or PayPal or other accounts for getting paid? Do you just do direct payments, getting started in an Australia, but my first client in Asia. Um, yeah, so PayPal takes a massive chunk of commissions when you get paid as a business. Uh, not ideal. Obviously, checks are pretty far to mail. Um, there's a company called Payoneer, P A Y O N E E R, that I use to accept payments from my US clients. Uh, they can pay pretty easily with credit card if they wanted to. And they can set that all up from their back end. It's really secure, very, very small commissions. It's safe and you can set it up so it goes straight into your bank account. So I'd recommend Payoneer. 
Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I think I kind of answered a few of these. Let's see. Resources. So interestingly enough, uh, I would actually recommend a book called Influence by Robert B. Cialdini. So this is a book that I think every freelancer or aspiring freelancer should read at least once. And it talks about the psychology of persuasion and how to get people to basically do the things you want them to do or to even buy into an idea that you might have. And it'll make you a really strong or at least stronger uh, persuasive person, someone who's friendlier to work with, someone who can take cr constructive criticism well, someone who can understand what people are thinking without needing them to say it, read between the lines, etc. So always recommend that book. Again, it's Influence by Robert B. Cialdini. Uh, and then maybe time for one more question. Let's see. Um, where is a good place to start teaching yourself UX design? I'm a visual designer who doesn't have any experience. Um, yeah, hey, I was mostly self-taught too. I would say start by looking at applications from the lens of a designer. Start to figure out what makes an app feel like it's intuitive, what's frustrating when you can't find something, what's the feedback like from the app? Is it giving you messages about if you're doing something well or if you need to click somewhere else, for example? Um, and then start studying that. Start putting together a mood board of things that you like. Start looking at other designers and just, just study. Don't worry about doing just yet. First, figure out the kind of stuff that you want to do. There's also a ton of courses. Like I used to teach at General Assembly. Obviously, I'm going to recommend General Assembly. Um, has a wonderful boot camp. And in my opinion, you learn more in those 12 weeks than I did in my four-year university career. Sorry, Waterloo. It's true. Um, and you could also take, there's a, a good course at Design Lab that's a bit shorter, um, which has, you can work with mentors. There's also a lot of free resources online on YouTube. Um, you could work with, you could work with individuals, do some test projects, find real clients to work with. Um, but the most important thing is that you want to learn that you got to start somewhere. And, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think. I covered as many questions as I could. It's 9.30. I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you so much for all of your, for taking the time to, um, to meet with us all, and to answer all these questions and kind of get some insight to the freelance and how it looks from this freelancer side. So I hand it over to Luis. Thank you. It's been amazing. I don't think I ever seen so many questions in the chat. I think you have broken <laughs> many records today, but uh, what can I say? I think uh, the, the best uh, thing that uh, I will suggest for everybody is to connect with Melissa, to find ways to, to collaborate with her. Uh, she also uh, is a great uh, mentor and also can coach you uh, if you have a, a, a desire to do that. And uh, yeah, for all the people that uh, wanted to, to keep more references, but they didn't have the time to type or to write down everything that they have uh, that we're mentioning, we are going to be sharing also the, the video recordings uh, pretty soon. Normally it takes around one day or two to go through the regular editing and going to YouTube. So in the meantime, uh, yeah, hang on tight and, and please uh, uh, yeah, share with Melissa uh, your gratitude and feedback to, to appreciate how much a care and therefore she has put together for the people that are in a mountain standard time just let you know that she is in toronto so she's two hours ahead of us and uh, yeah for being at 9 30 p.m after a hard day of work uh yeah we have to just say thank you so much for, yeah. for staying with us that late thank you thank you guys so much for having me honestly and for giving me a platform to hopefully encourage people to really seriously consider freelancing and all the benefits for it. I, I think our system is a little bit dated in education. And I think that entrepreneurship is the way of the future and freelancing is a great way to start that out. So um, just some parting words, guys, believe in yourselves. It is possible. I am not particularly special. I just wanted to take a leap of faith and here we are. You guys can do this too. You can do exactly what I'm doing and then some. So 
happy to help however I can. Feel free to connect with me and let's chat. Let's keep the conversation going. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, um, but hopefully I'll be back. They'll be around too at some point. Who knows? Who knows? And thank you guys so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's it's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, what can I say? You're special to us. And uh, if I can take a one a big lesson from you is that every minute is a choice. So thank you for making the choice to, to stay with us that late. Thank you everybody for making the choice to, to stay with us, to, to join us.